Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We are so excited to, uh, to be having service today, and I also want to say Happy New Year. Um, what, what an exciting year, for one, for us to pass out of 2020 uh, and leave that year behind us so that we might step into to New Year of 2021. It is great um, to be able to do that, and it's great to be able to do that here today with you all. And so, uh, first, I want to introduce myself. For those of you who do not know, my name is Charles, uh, although I think most of you guys know that by now. Um, but we want to greet you. And if you are a guest here today, I, I want to say thank you for being here today. We are so grateful to have you worshiping alongside of us. Uh, I want to encourage you to look at our bulletin. One on the back of the bulletin gives information uh, about this upcoming week, which will go will highlight a couple things. But also, there's a slip of paper on the inside of it. And uh, the slip of paper, you just tear that off, place that in the offering box that's located in the back foyer. This gives us as a church the opportunity to know you, to pray for you, uh, to just love on you to the best of our ability. So we encourage you to do that. Um, also this morning, I want to highlight our Sunday school. We had 82 uh, in Sunday school this morning, which was a little bit low, but considering the day, I, I'm encouraged by that 82. And I want to encourage you to be a part of a Sunday school class our church is offering them in a, in a lot of ways, whether it's online or here in person. But Sunday school is really important for us to gather together in a smaller group to pray with one another, to get to, to um, read through the Word of God, and to build one another up. And so I encourage you to find a Sunday school class and to become plugged into a Sunday school class. Uh, some things on the back of the bulletin that I want to highlight. One, as you can tell in front of me, we are doing the Lord's Supper this morning. And so if you have not gotten the Lord's Supper materials during the Let Us Break Bread Together song, I encourage you to come forward and, and grab those. If you have not gotten them yet, please do so, so that we might take the Lord's Supper together here later. Also, just a special announcement. We had announced that this week we were going to start our children's activities out at the Outreach Center. That has been postponed until the 20th. Uh, due to COVID, and so we just want to let you guys know that on the 20th of January now, we will be starting back up with our children's activities out at the Outreach Center. We're excited about being able to do that, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, let us prepare our hearts to worship God through the reading of His Word. Today is Romans, 1, or Romans 8, 1 and 2, and it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What a beautiful truth that we can grab a hold of today, that we are not condemned by the sin that we commit, but that we are set free by the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. As Philip comes forward to pray for us, I want to encourage us to be thinking about that reality of the fact that we have freedom in Christ through His shed blood. Philip, if you'll pray for us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, Father, what a blessing it is to wake up knowing that we're your children, Lord. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together. And Father, let our hearts be ever reminded that how important it is that we come together as a body, Lord. How important it is for our growth. How important it is for our daily lives, Lord, that we can walk alongside one another with you, Jesus, and help each other through times. Father, I pray for everyone who's affected by sickness, Lord, this coronavirus, uh, the one who's experienced deaths in their families, Lord. Father, that's the the sign of your children, Lord, that we come along these families who are dealing with these and just help them, Lord. Father, give them encouragement. And Father, as we start this new year, Father, we don't know the trials that we're going to face, but Lord, as long as we have you, we're never alone. We don't have to walk them alone. And thank you, Jesus, that you love us that much, that you're there for us, Lord. And Father, we just want to lift up our family members, Lord, who, who don't know you, the people that don't know you, the lost. And that's what our hearts should be, Lord. We should be reaching for the lost, Lord, that they know you, know your word, Lord, and can find the peace and comfort that comes through it, Lord. Father, you be with us as we go out this day, as you always are. Father, thank you. We love you. And it's an honor to be your children. Father, we just ask you just to be with this country. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
first hymn this morning, There is a Fountain. Let us break bread together. It's 366. If you haven't got your cup and bread, come and get it at this time as we stand.
Thank you, Libby, for that. And we appreciate you uh, through the piano reminding us of the wonderful gift we've been given by way of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that. Well, we're currently in a series of sermons, and that series is called, uh, Who is Jesus to You? And uh, the purpose of this series, which is based upon the Gospel of Luke, is to not only establish the right information about Jesus, but also to help us establish a right relationship with Him. And uh, so this morning's sermon is titled, The Incarnation. And it's based upon Luke's Gospel, the second chapter, verses 41 through 52. Now, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn to that passage of Scripture because we're getting ready to read it right now. Now, what I want you to do as we look at this passage of Scripture is just listen to this story because that's what it is. It's a story from Jesus' childhood. It's easy to understand. And so let's just pay attention and allow the story to speak to us about this particular event in Jesus' boyhood. So we're in Luke, the second chapter, beginning at verse 41. Every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Now we know that from the very beginning here, Luke has given us the reason for his writing his gospel. It's to lay out the facts about Jesus Christ for Theophilus. Now we're not exactly sure who Theophilus was, but that was his purpose, Luke's purpose for writing this gospel, to research and lay out the facts about Jesus. And so here we see a story that Luke has included in his gospel, a story of Jesus' boyhood. But you know, it really kind of calls into question why this story. I mean, obviously Jesus uh, had a childhood in which Luke could have accessed and put in print uh, any number of stories from his childhood. So why was this the one story that Luke decided to put in his account of the life of Jesus? Well, that's really our purpose here this morning, and uh, what we're going to see here in just a few moments as we spend some time here with this passage is that this particular story lays the foundation for the most important fact regarding Jesus Christ. It's so important, in fact, that we're going to put it up on the screen here for you so that we can look at it and think about it for a few, few moments. Jesus, who is the Son of God, was also fully human. That's what this story does. It lays the foundation for that truth. Now listen, church, if that is not true, if what you're seeing on the screen is not true, then Christianity falls flat. Uh, Christianity becomes a lifeless, powerless religion like other, all, all other false religions. It has no power to transform, no power to, tr to change. It is this fact that makes it what it is, the power of salvation, the gospel. Now, this particular sermon then answers the question, why did it have to be this way? I don't know if you've ever wondered this or not or thought this, but have you ever just wondered, why did God have to save the world in this way? Why couldn't God just have, at some point in time, just said to the world, hey, look, I know that you're sinners, but look, we're just going to write that off. I'm just going to forget about it. And, you know, when you die, we're all going to be together and we're going to be one big happy family. Why couldn't God just do that? Well, if you stay with me here this morning, uh, you'll understand why it had to be this way. We're going to draw some conclusions from this particular passage of Scripture and then other passages of Scripture that are going to help us see and understand the importance of the fact that Jesus was fully human, but also 
fully God. Now here's the first observation we're going to make about these verses, all right? These verses support the truth that Jesus was fully God and fully human. That's why he included, uh, Luke included this story here in his account of the life of Jesus. Now we read it previously, the story was easy to follow. You, you heard what happened, Jesus got left behind, they looked for him, they found him in the temple, they were astounded at his answers, uh, then he goes back with them to Nazareth and he, he grows up. Uh, we, we know the story, but what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to how Luke used that story to support this very important truth about Jesus, that he was fully God and fully human. He does it in this story. So we see him showing Jesus, first of all, as being fully God when we look at verses 46 through 50. So look at those verses right there. In those verses, 46 through 50, we see some clues that Luke gives us about God, uh, G Jesus being fully God. He does it in two ways. In verse 47, if you'll look at that, it says, And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. Jesus is in the temple. He's talking to the teachers of the law. These are men who have devoted their entire lives to understanding God's word. And here is a 12-year-old boy who is astounding them with his questions and with his answers. Luke is saying something very simple. The only way a 12-year-old boy could have done that is if he was God. Another way that he's showing Jesus to be God is later there in verse 49 at the very end of it. His mother had asked him, why have you treated us this way? And at the very end of verse 49, he asked this question. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? Don't miss this. Luke, of all the things he could have recorded, of all the stories he could have included... Of all the many things that Jesus may have said as a child, Luke made sure that the very first words that he wrote down in his gospel coming from the mouth of Jesus was about his mission to be here with us. That's huge. That's big. Luke did that on purpose, I'm sure. The very first words we see coming from Jesus' lips speak about the fact that he has to be involved in the, the Father's affairs. You know, that word necessary there adds even more impact to the statement. He says, it was necessary for me to be in my father's house. That word necessary means it was appropriate. It was even an obligation. That's why Jesus came, was to be involved in the affairs of God. So we see Luke showing Jesus to be God in those verses. But then later in this section, he shows Jesus to be fully human. We see that in verses 51 and 52. And we see it in three ways. It first of all says at the very end of verse 51 that he went to Nazareth and was obedient to them. In other words, to say it more simply, uh, Jesus followed the typical path of childhood, a normal path of childhood. Now, wait a minute, uh, it says he was obedient to them, so that may not necessarily qualify as normal, uh, but uh, you, you get the gist there, right? Uh, he followed a, norm, a typical path of, of, of being a child. He was with his parents. He was, he was obedient to them. Th that's a part of human development. It goes on to say that he increased in wisdom and, and stature. In other words, he matured mentally. He matured physically. And then it says that he increased in favor with God and with people. So he matured socially. These are all human developments. In these short verses here, Luke has rightly displayed Jesus to be fully God, but also fully human. Now, let's make sure we've got it. It isn't that Jesus, a man, showed up and he had a little bit of God in him. And it wasn't that here was God and there was a little bit of human in him. This was the full union of two natures. God and humanity. And this is a mystery, church. I can't explain it. We can't fully understand it in this life, but we know the Bible presents it as truth, and so we take it by faith that in Jesus Christ, there was both fully the presence of God and humanity. Now, here's the $64,000 question. Why is that important? Here's why it's important. Because in Jesus Christ, the coming together of these two natures, it solves the greatest problem that humanity faces. Now right now, if I was to ask you here this morning, what's one of the greatest problems facing humanity? You might say the coronavirus, or you might say our political system, or, or any other number of answers. 
But church, the Bible has made it plain from the very beginning. The biggest problem facing humanity is sin. Amen or oh me. It's been plainly shown to us in God's word. That's the greatest problem we face. And in the God-man, Jesus Christ, there is the solution to that problem. You see, this is what sin does. Sin separates us from God. That's a simple law, spiritual law. Sin separates us from God. And a life that is continually separated from God in this life ends up experiencing eternal death. That's the greatest problem we face. But in the God-man, who is both fully human and fully God, we see the solution to that problem. Now, church, I want to take a few moments now and talk about the significance of both of these aspects of the nature of Jesus Christ, that he was fully human, but also fully God. So let's talk about the significance of him being fully human for a few moments. You see, there's a, there's a reason for that. There's something that's significant about that, and this is what it is. Because he is human, he can make atonement for humanity. That is one of the most important aspects of this whole idea of Jesus being both fully God and fully man. Because he is human, he can provide atonement for humanity. Now, don't let that word atonement uh, throw you off there. Uh, atonement, if you just look at the word itself, it tells you what it means. Just break it down. At one meant. Okay? So what is atonement? It means that through what Jesus Christ did on the cross and his resurrection, he alone can help us, sinful humanity, be at one with God. So that's what Jesus did for us, and that's a part of him being fully human. He is able to be, bring atonement for you and me. Let me just ask you, have you, ever, have you ever met someone that was perfect? You ever met somebody perfect? Uh, those of us who've gotten married, maybe there was a time when you were in that courtship stage and you thought that person was perfect, and then you got married and find out that they weren't, right? Uh, I, I, I've met some people that, that, by the way they act and the way they talk, it seems to me that they think that they're perfect. Have you ever met anybody like that? But the Bible makes it plain. No one is perfect but God, Amen. And not only that, the Bible also makes it plain that we as humanity are not perfect. The Bible says, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the Bible makes it plain. We, as humanity, are imperfect. We are sinners. We can't achieve perfection. No one, no single human being has lived the perfect life except one. If we go to 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 22, it tells us this, Jesus did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Now that's about as plain as you can make it. Jesus was fully human, but he did not commit sin. Now, another way of saying that is that Jesus was righteous before God. Because Jesus had lived the, his entire human life without sin, he had experienced a righteousness before God. Now, I know right now we may be saying, man, that's great for Jesus, glad he did that, but what about us? Brother Robbie, you just got through telling us from the Bible that we're all sinners. Yeah, it's great that Jesus lived a righteous life, but what about us? Well, here's the good news. Jesus died for us. He lived a perfect life so that he could then die a perfect death for you and me, so that we can become the righteousness of God. Listen to Second chapter, uh, I mean, uh, Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 21. It says, He, that being God, made the one who did not know sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I can't be righteous on my own. I've tried it. You've tried it. No human being can do it. Jesus did it. He was fully human, lived a righteous life before God. There's no hope for me on my own. The only way I can be righteous is if I am, as this verse said, in Him. And if I am in, if I am in Him, then I have been imputed the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So the consequence of sin has been taken care of if we place our faith in Jesus Christ. 
We don't become perfect or sinless, but God looks at us through the lens of the blood of Jesus Christ and sees us as righteous. Now, all of that was made possible because Jesus was fully human. That's the importance of that. But we also know that Jesus was fully God. So what's the importance of that? What's the significance of that? Here it is. Because he is God, his atonement has infinite value. What Jesus did on the cross and then later through his resurrection, it has infinite value because of the fact that Jesus was not only fully, God, uh, fully human, but he was also fully God. Now this is rooted in the truth that Jesus died a sacrificial death for you and for me. Now, we're used to this idea of sacrificial deaths, aren't we? I mean, you've been in church, you've been in Sunday school, uh, you've been in Sunday school lessons that talk about the Old Testament. You've heard about the sacrificial system. You know that uh, they, they had to take animals and that they had to uh, use them as sacrifices for any number of reasons. And one of those reasons was to forgive sin. And this is all rooted in a truth that is revealed to us in Hebrews that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, that was something that God put in place. And that's just a God law. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So it requires the shedding of blood for there to be forgiveness. You also perhaps know, maybe you don't, but let me just inform you, that in the Old Testament, in Judaism, once a year, the high priest would sacrifice an animal, take the blood from that animal, which was supposed to be unblemished and pure, and take that blood into the Holy of Holies and then sprinkle it over top of the mercy seat. That was done once a year, and the purpose for that was to atone for the sins of all the people. That was a part of the sacrificial system. The problem with that was it had to be done every year. But Jesus and his sacrificial death was different. Listen to what it says in Hebrews in the ninth chapter. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, but into heaven himself, itself so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, Jesus would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now listen to this. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. What was the difference between the blood of an animal and the blood of Jesus? Well, Jesus only had to do it one time. That's what the Bible says. One time, he paid the price for the sins of the world. Why was it effective? Because this was blood from the God-man. This was blood that flowed on the cross and at Calvary that was not sourced from an animal. It didn't come from a good human being. This blood that was shed on the cross came from the one who was both fully human, and fully God. This blood was untainted by sin. It was pure and perfect in every way. And since this blood that flowed from the God-man was from the infinite one, it has an infinite effect for you and for me. So you see, it had to be this way. God had to save the world by sending his son Jesus. Jesus had to be fully God and fully man. It was the only way to satisfy two requirements that were necessary. And here they are. It was necessary to satisfy the wages of sin. You know what the Bible says about the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. That had to be satisfied. Jesus satisfied that by going to the cross and dying. But that wasn't the only thing he had to satisfy. He had to maintain the integrity, the perfection of God. And so by Jesus being both fully human but also fully God, he lived a sinless life. He maintained the perfectness, the holiness of God by never sinning. And those two events, those two truths, the wages of sin is death and the holiness of God, they came together in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that we appropriate or we grasp what Jesus did on the cross. We grasp salvation through faith. 
by placing our faith in Him, by surrendering our lives to Him, by making Him the number one person in our lives. That's how we experience this atonement, this salvation. But it was made possible, and it was the only way for it to be possible, by Jesus being totally human, but also totally God. Paul Harvey likes, liked to tell the story, uh, this story, around this time of year. I can't tell it as well as he did, but I'll give it a shot. This story was about a man, a good man, a decent man, but he was not a religious man. And this whole uh, business about God coming to the earth and the virgin birth and Jesus being the incarnation, the Son of God, he just didn't see that, uh, believe that, couldn't deal with that. Well, it was Christmas uh, Eve, and his wife informed him that she was going to church for the church service on Christmas Eve and asked if he wanted to go, but he said no, he would rather stay at home. He would kind of feel like a hypocrite going to the church service, seeing that he didn't believe in any of that. So she went on to the church service, and he stayed at home, and it began to snow, and it came down really heavy. So he grabbed his newspaper and settled in beside the fireplace to read the newspaper and have a cup of coffee and relax. And it was a wonderful evening for a little while until suddenly he heard a thump. And then another thump. And he got up to see what was going on and he realized it was coming from the front window of their living room. A huge plate glass window that they had in their house. He went over to the window and there was another thump. And it was a bird that has crashed into the big picture window. And had fallen down into the snow stunned. And he looked down and there were other birds that had done this. He realized what had happened. Uh, the snow was coming down so heavy that this flock of birds was confused. But they saw the big picture window and it was clear and so they thought they could fly in that direction but they were smashing into the plate glass. Well, being a decent individual, he saw them laying there in the snow and he thought, I can't let them suffer like this, but what can I do? And so he thought about the barn that was a few yards away on his property. So he put his boots on and his coat on and waded out into the snow and went over to the barn and opened the doors and turned on the lights to, to see if those birds maybe would fly into the barn. But they didn't do anything but continue to crash into the window. So then he thought, well, I'll, I'll leave them over there maybe with some breadcrumbs. So he went into the house and got some breadcrumbs and, and started to sprinkle them from where the birds were over to the barn, hoping they would follow the food and, and find safety there in that warm, lit barn. But that didn't work either. And so he finally went over to where they were and began to wave his arms and, and yell at them to try and, and shoo them over in that direction toward the barn. But that just made things worse. They just scattered all over the place. And finally he realized, they're afraid of me. To them I must be a strange and terrifying creature waving my arms like that. If only if I could think of some way to let them know that they could trust me, he thought. Then I could tell them that I'm not trying to hurt them, but I'm really trying to help them. And then he said to himself, if only I could become a bird. Then I could speak their language. I could mingle with them. I could, I could tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to that safe, warm barn. But that would mean I would have to become one of them so that I could help them see and understand. And at that moment, in the distance, he heard the church bells ring. A familiar song. O oh, come, all ye faithful. And it was at that moment that he finally understood why God had to become a man and why Jesus came to be with us. C.S. Lewis said this about the incarnation. It's about as simple as you can make it, so we're going to put it up on the screen here for you to think about. C.S. Lewis said this, The Son of God became a man that men might become sons of God. That's the incarnation, folks. That's why Jesus came. And it had to be this way. He had to be fully human so that he could represent sinful humanity to God. But he also had to be fully God so his death and resurrection would have infinite value. 
So that leads me to ask you this morning this question. Are you a child of God? Can you say that today? Have you made that decision in your life to trust the one who died on the cross for you? Who was resurrected three days later so that he could give you the gift of eternal life? Are you a child of God? Listen, if you're not, if you've come to the realization here today that you've never made that step of faith and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the God-man, you can do that today. We're going to have a hymn of invitation, and you're going to have an opportunity to come forward and to make that decision. Those of you who are perhaps listening, you can do it right there in the privacy of your own home. You can simply pray and ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin, to surrender that life to Him, and to ask Him to come into your heart and to be your Lord and Savior. If God is speaking to your heart here this morning to make that decision, we're encouraging you to do that. And if we can help in any kind of way, we want you to do that as well. Believer, what about you? Are you living a life today out of gratitude for what Jesus Christ did for you? You know, the Bible makes it very plain that what Jesus did on the cross was a sacrificial death. It was a death that he experienced that we deserved. Does that fill you with gratitude for what he did? Are you living a life that shows that you are thankful for who he is and what he's done for you? If not, I want to encourage you to make a decision today as well. That today might be the day when you say, you know, I'm going to live a life in such a fashion where it shows my appreciation for who Jesus is and what he's done for me. I'm going to live a life that honors him, that brings glory to him, because he solved for me the greatest problem I could ever face, the problem of sin. Is God speaking to your heart here this morning? We want to give you an opportunity to make a decision, so I'm going to ask that our musicians move to their places now and be prepared to play for us as we sing this hymn. This is your time in which you can make a decision here today. Maybe it's to do, as we just said, to experience the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ by surrendering your life to Him. Maybe as a believer you need to come forward and rededicate your life and say, I need to start living for Christ in a very concrete kind of way. Perhaps you just need to come to this altar and spend some time in prayer as we start this new year. However God is speaking to you this morning, we're encouraging you to come. Won't you do that? Steve, come and lead us in this invitation hymn. And if God is speaking to you, you come.
Amen. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you to be seated now, if you would, please. We, as a church, celebrate or uh, take part in the Lord's Supper quarterly, and we do it at the beginning of the quarter, and so this is the first Sunday of this first quarter, and so we're going to do that, but obviously, because of uh, the coronavirus, we're going to be doing it a little bit differently than we have in the past. So I want to, first of all, begin by saying if you don't have the elements, uh, we invite you to come forward and get that right now. So you'll need that to, to participate in this. Also, this is a little bit different process, but it doesn't negate the importance or the significance of what we're doing in any kind of way. You see, we're gathered here because Jesus told us to do this very thing in remembrance of him. And it's not just in remembrance of the fact that he walked on the earth and that he was a good teacher and that he showed us how to live our lives. We're doing this in remembrance of the price that he paid for you and me. We have two elements. We have the bread and we have the juice. And those two elements represent Jesus and what he did for us. We know because of what the Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross. And he did so for a purpose, to redeem us. And through his death and his sacrificial death, he made a way for you and me to experience salvation. And so we do this in remembrance of the great sacrifice that he made for us. But this is also an opportunity for you personally right now, in observance of what Jesus did, to take spiritual inventory. The Bible tells us to do that. The Bible tells us that we are to partake in this, but we're to also make sure that our hearts are right with the Lord. And so what we're going to do here this morning is we're just going to take a few moments of silent prayer time. It's going to allow you to spend a few moments silently praying. And what you might do during this time is to ask the Lord to help you take a spiritual inventory. Simply ask the question, Lord, is there anything in me that is displeasing in your sight? Lord, is there anything in me that, that I need to surrender to you? Is there a part of my life where you need to become Lord more so than you are right now? If you'll just do that, that'll prepare your hearts for what we're about to do. So let's do that right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right now, close your eyes, and spend some time with the Lord and say, Lord, reveal to me anything in me that is not pleasing in your sight. And then give me the courage to not only confess that, but to give you permission to change that and for me to cooperate with that. Just spend a few moments doing that right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice for us. Lord, we know based upon what we heard today from your word that it had to be this way. Yet, Jesus, you were not uh, a victim of circumstance. You weren't in the wrong place at the wrong time. You were just in the exact right place you needed to be. You came here with a mission to be the means by which we as sinful people could be in a right relationship with a holy God. And we know, Lord, that it required you to pay the price for our sins. That was the way that you provided a path for us to know you and to know God personally. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, if there's anything in us that is unpleasing in your sight, if there is a habit, a pattern of living that needs to change, Lord, we pray that you convict us of that right now. Show us the error of our ways and give us encouragement and strength to live a life that truly glorifies you and we ask this in your name amen now i'm going to ask you at this point to try and remove that top layer off of the element there and get that small wafer and i'm going to read from the gospel of mark 
At verse 22 of chapter 14, it says this, As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. Now I'm going to ask you to peel off that second layer. And in the next verse, it says this, Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we know from what your word tells us, that it's by your stripes that we are healed. The suffering that was inflicted upon you was rightfully ours, but you took our place. And not only did you experience the cross for us, but Lord, you came out on the other side victorious, defeating death and offering to us the gift of eternal life if we put our faith in you. Lord, we're grateful for what you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to live lives that show that gratitude, that show our willingness to honor you in all that we say and do. Lord, we thank you for this act of remembrance that brings us together and unites us as the body of Christ. May we go forward from this place fully recognizing the responsibility we have not only individually but corporately to be your hands and your feet, to embody you in a lost and dying world. We thank you for that privilege. And we ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. And we're going to sing to be dismissed. Is that correct? All right. He lives.